it behooves us as Canadians to look to our close friend and neighbour, the United States of America, and ask what is on the horizon for our dear friend, the United States of America. So here today to talk about the United States is our friend, the president of the Brownstone Institute, Jeffrey Tucker. It's so nice to be here. Thank you. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So welcome, Jeffrey. It's great to see you and uh, bravo on you and your entire team at the Brownstone Institute as you come up on your third end anniversary. And if our audience is not familiar with the Brownstone Institute, I think that they're one of the, the leading lights for, dare I say, common sense, liberty, and all good thinking uh, in terms of public policy in the United States of America. Or how would you describe your mission at the Brownstone Institute, Jeffrey? Well, it's expanded. <laughs> Indeed. I have to say, when I, when I started Brownstone, I had a sense that there was uh, an urgent crisis afoot in civilization. We'd never seen anything like lockdowns before. Uh, you know, society-wide vaccine mandates, uh, restrictions on travel, uh, closures of churches, businesses, uh, freedom of association, freedom of speech, everything was everything was trashed essentially. And and I had a sense that it was kicking off some disastrous stage, uh, maybe a decade uh, or more. And and I was right. You were so right. So we've we've tried to cover every aspect of this. You know, from from the attack on civil rights to censorship to uh, the vaccines. And, and and what is it that happened to us? And how did we get here? Um, there's so many layers and meanings to all of this stuff. There's a political dimension. There's a medical mm -hmm. scientific dimension. There's there's a lot of strange things going on uh, and many, many ways to look at it. So that's what Brownstone has been uh, devoted to doing. But it, it's, it's all happened in a strange time because in many ways, there was, uh, c c coinciding with the lockdowns and everything that followed, there was also a, a strange political purge that was alive, both mm -hmm. in, in, in the U.S. and, and all uh, Commonwealth countries, too, mm -hmm. um, to drive out of professions people that were, I would call them sort of dissidents, um, against the prevailing orthodoxies. And, and that is intensifying. And it's, it's all over academia, it's in media in technology and in politics and and that is getting more and more intense by the day I so agree. we're combating that in addition to everything else sometimes i have to say i i'm just grateful that we still have the freedom to write and publish because in a strange way i can say with a lot of confidence that it was not supposed to be this way we're supposed to have supposed to have been shut down by now. <laughs> wow. And well, they, they haven't gotten their way. And so we're still alive and kicking and breathing for now. Indeed. Well, we certainly admire the work that you and uh, the entire team at the Brownstone Institute do, Jeffrey. And, and I think that, I mean, you're, you're kind of a kindred institute in the sense that we're nonpartisan, but we're really trying to serve the larger nation. Yeah in yeah. terms of bringing a, a perspective and a thoughtful insight on, on what's going on and, and uh, really engaging people to not take their freedom and liberties for granted, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so, just watching yeah. an interview today with, uh, there's this guy named Al Gore who once ran for the Democratic nomination. Okay. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, he, it was really a startling interview because he, uh, because he he's re, he's regretting the existence of the internet essentially, and he says it's it's really did, very. Did he bad. not invent the internet, uh, yeah. Jeffrey? Oh, no. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. <laughs> Remember that one? <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes, he invented. He the did internet. not. In, he did not. For the record, no, he did not. But he says, it, but he's re, he's regretting everything about it, mm -hmm. and and saying that. Um, you can't have a democratic society so long as there's uh, such a wide diversity of opinions on everything. 
I beg your pardon? Said, what? Yeah, that's what he said. He said, he said uh, democratic <clears throat> society requires a consensus on core truths that we used to be able to take for granted, that the, they were given to us by media, they were given to us by government, and oh everybody my. agreed on them. And within that framework, then we could debate and discuss. He said, but now, you know, anybody could just find out anything. And he said, he said, uh, people are just getting on the internet and chasing, going, going down rabbit holes and ending in echo chambers, he says. Isn't and that interesting? And okay. it makes you realize just how severe the threat really is of censorship these days. Agreed. So we're going to go down the rabbit hole together, okay. Jeffrey holding hands as we look to the 2024 year. And I do want to uh, get your help because, you know, we have an audience uh, worldwide, but particularly uh, from Canada. And it's interesting, like I would say that um, part of my, Amer my family is American, and I would say that there's an element, and this is very humbling, even though we're close in proximity to the United States, we're kind of in an information bubble, I would say, as we get a lot of the mainstream media out of the United States. So I'm going to dare to, with your kind help, if you can give us a bit of a primer on the state of the United States as we yep. go through, um, you know, kind of catching up on, on things. Because this is going to be a pivotal year, I mm -hmm. think, for the United States. And dare I say for Canada, uh, by virtue of that, and, and certainly many parts of the world. So I... I need your help. So last time we spoke, we talked a lot about reflecting about COVID-19 and, and kind of rebuilding and renewing society. And that was a, a very, I think, a very insightful discussion. And I think one of the punchlines out of this is that, wow, we have a lot of the receipts and the data um, and then some, and we'd like more data. But we do know that Sweden did it right, did they? Is, would you agree with that, Jeffrey? Yeah, they went too far. Um, I think they closed some schools for uh, uh, older, uh, late high school uh, and college. Um, but for the most part, compared with most Commonwealth countries in the U.S., um, it seemed very open to almost everybody. And there were no masks and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then they got a little carried away with vaccines. But so they went too far. I think by any standard, if the rest of the world didn't exist, you'd look at Sweden and go, wow, they went crazy over COVID. But but actually, compared to the rest of the world, they were fantastic and they did a good job. Unfortunately, there's they're not really taking credit for it. There is a, a report that came out of Sweden uh, just this week, I think, that that is shy about about bragging about yeah. how well they did the Swedish um, way. Um, yeah. So it's it's fascinating because you would think that they would be crowing about their great successes, mm -hmm. but. Uh, the problem is there was such an international outlier that at this point there's a great deal of, of pressure from many, many sources for them to um, not take credit for the good job that they yeah. did. But it, it's so ironic. So to be clear, um, as so many parts of the, the so-called Western world uh, locked down and kind of went down that kind of conventional path of groupthink, yeah. um, Sweden didn't nearly to that extent. And, and the yeah. mortality rates, everything, uh, economics uh, prove that. I mean, that's pretty yeah. obvious. They have the lowest excess deaths in all of Europe, actually, um, which, and that's just the, that's just the, the, the COVID piece of this, but, but from an economic point of view, they, they really didn't experience any serious disruptions mm -hmm. and, and they don't have, you know, the suicide epidemics we have, the collapse mm -hmm. in public health. Uh, that we've seen in the U.S. and Commonwealth countries, it's it's really been a tremendous tragedy. The la the learning losses in the U.S. and maybe Canada, Canadians, in Canada as well. Uh, they, um, you know, our our students have lost at least two years, but it seems to be every time they take a measurement, it seems to be getting more. So it was two, then it was three, then it was four. <laughs> so we're uh, we've devastated a whole generation. No, it, it's it's really really sad and. I was just talking with a teacher the other day who was saying that um, they have so many nine-year-olds in their class that really behave like five-year-olds. It's very sad yeah. because that socialization yeah. uh, did not happen. So um, we've got a lot of a lot of work to do to catch up and, and look after the kids among so many others. So one of the things I did want to highlight is some of the extraordinary research that Brownstone yourself has have been involved with not the least of which has been working with um, associates like Naomi Wolf on um, really looking at the hard data 
um, the information, really peeling the onion to the nth degree on really um, the state of vaccines and they're safe, are they safe and efficacious and really getting down to that kind of data around the impacts on people. Um, is there a way that you could summarize this, Jeffrey, and just highlight that? Yeah, there's usually three standards we use for any kind of medication. One is necess necessary, the other is safe, and the other is effective. Uh, the problem is that the COVID-19 vaccine fails on all three fronts, more so than any single uh, medication probably ever, certainly vaccine, but even medication ever approved by the FDA. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, <clears throat> necessary, safe, and effective. Okay, so... Uh, the necessary point is that COVID was never a threat to the dominant working age population of health mm -hmm. people and the virtually zero uh, threat to kids. Um, so there's that. It was never necessary. I mean, you could argue that it was necessary. A, a working vaccine would have been a viable tool mm -hmm. uh, for for elderly people who were infirm, who were actually in danger. But uh, but then you get to the second point about, about well, let's just say, effective. And it wasn't effective. It never stopped infection and never stopped transmission. In fact, we have a, a tremendous amount of data that suggests that the vaccine actually made people more vulnerable to other kinds of infections, which is not untypical in the history of vaccines. It's called, uh, it's, it's called original antigenic sin, which is to say uh, the vaccine, especially one for a deprecated strain, uh, like alpha or delta or something like that, mm -hmm is going to rewire your immune system to make to, to make it only think about that one uh, mutation, that one variant, and to make yourself vulnerable to all the other variants that are circulating simultaneously, and then open your immune system to other forms of maladies, mm -hmm. whether it's rashes or tinnitus or, you know, something. So there's that. And then uh, then you have these mystery um, myocarditis outbreaks that are all over the place that are leading to grave injury and death. And and we've never seen anything like this in the vaccine world. I mean, it, it puts to shame, you know, every other uh, vaccine that we've we've ever had. When I was a kid, they tried to get us all to take the vaccine. But this was sometime in the 1970s tried to get everybody to take a, a vaccine for the swine flu, and it turned out that there were a, just a handful of reports mm -hmm. of um, of injuries and fatalities from this, and they called it off instantly. And, the, and I, I remember that my vaccine was scheduled in the public school, and I was terrified of it. And then they just said, oh, we're not going to take it. And I was thrilled, right? So mm -hmm. they're not doing it this time. Um, uh, because the standards have dramatically changed. The other problem is, and we can get into this or not, but the COVID-19 vaccine um, really exists under different kinds of level of regulatory approval from any yes. vaccine in history. It's uh, the so-called uh, emergency use authorization. But even aside from that, it was authorized as a military countermeasure. Yeah, uh, so, so it, was, the, it was kind of a workaround to the, the, the typical process that we'd envision. It yeah. was a military... Um, regulatory framework that was used right so it was it was neither necessary nor safe nor effective and yeah. this is a major problem and it's a huge scandal in fact there's pretty much a, a a taboo around this topic i mean for the very first time in our whole political season in the u.s last night was the first night uh in in all four gop uh debates that the subject of uh, the vaccines came up at all and even then, you could almost feel it in the room, this this sort of feel of like, oh, no, what's going to happen now? You Interesting. Know? And and I'm so happy to say that at least two of the candidates said that they were going to eliminate <clears throat> the indemnification for um, liability that these oh vaccines have. Okay, I missed so, that one. So you're saying that, that during the Republican debate, yeah. the, the, the whole issue <clears throat> that the vaccines were not maybe safe and effective, and that there was, uh, there, it begs the issue that their, their so-called uh, sweetheart agreement yeah. uh, with the manufacturers that would indemnify them, at least save them from any liability for some, was yeah. it 75 years, as, if memory serves me correctly, Jeffrey? Something uh, like that. I, really, yeah. it's, 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 it's ever, there's a slight process 
that you can appeal to the government for if you believe that um, something went wrong, but there have been 12,000 people who have tried to do this, and that you, you can't have legal representation, there's no appeal, you, mm -hmm. there's no transparency to it. Only eight people have been granted any kind of compensation out of you know potentially hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. who are injured from this. And this is all traces to a law that was passed in 1986 that was renewed under the um, emergency use authorization and reinforced in a March 13th, 2020 uh, edict. And so there were, there's no recourse to the injured. And it was, it was very heartbreaking that this would ever happen in a free society. So this came up by the, the one of the moderators, whose name is Megan Kelly, and she herself was vaccine injured. And so she has a personal stake in this oh, and actually okay. asked them about it. And both DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy said that the, that the, that indemnification should be eliminated immediately. Isn't now, it's a long word, and it sounds complicated, but the point is that it's very likely these companies would not uh, would not be in business if if it weren't for the indemnification. They would their the stocks would fall to zero, and they'd probably be instantly. Uh, most certainly, they'd be instantly bro uh, bankrupt. Indeed. So this is losses. a this is a big story. Not yeah. only in the United States, but you know, the, the, it'll be interesting to see how those floodgates open inevitably. Yeah. Uh, as they say, the truth will set us free. And um, so that will be fascinating. And what's also interesting is this is turning into a, uh, frankly, a, a month of bombshells. Uh, we all heard about Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter, or uh, formerly Twitter, now X, it was essentially a crime scene. And we know that there was the release of the Twitter files and he assigned these to some pretty crack journalists, including uh, Matt Taibbi and, and uh, Michael Schellenberg, among others. And what was fascinating is that we learned a lot about the receipts around the um, so-called censorship industry, the, the uh, emphasis that governments were directing social media companies to ironically squelch the kind of information that we're talking about uh, yeah. regarding COVID-19, instead of enabling um, healthy, open debate to seek truth and uh, in service of uh, people, they were doing the opposite. I mean, it's just stunning. And now we've got almost like a, a second revelation of bombshells um, related to, wow, it wasn't just kind of half measures of censorship. This is a full-fledged complex. You, you've, mm -hmm. you've referred to it several times, uh, Jeffrey, as the kind of a, the censorship industrial complex. Can you help us yeah. understand what's going on there? I think a lot of Canadians are still, um, pardon the pun, but very much in the dark on this yeah. entire topic. It's, it's really yeah. hard to believe. It's night, a judge yeah. even described it as 1984. Yeah. The, we have a First Amendment in this country that says uh, Congress can make no law abridging the freedom of speech, which by Congress means government. So the government cannot actually tell you what you can and cannot say and cannot tell companies what they can and cannot say. So uh, what happened was they started uh, developing, a lot of these agencies started developing um, new agencies, and those new agencies were tagging third-party uh, nonprofit organizations, universities, foundations, other research groups, volunteer groups that were related contracting out with the FBI, with the Cybersecurity Information Security Agency, and many, many other agencies. And we've seen maps of these things, and they're the most complicated maps you've ever seen. So, like we're talking allowed, real organization charts of like yeah. 67 alphabet bureaucracy. Yeah bureaucratic That's organizations, right. right? And what this allowed was what they called switch switchboarding. So you would just kind of move between the organizations and send out threatening emails, uh, have meetings, regularly scheduled meetings, embedded uh, employees. Twitter had many, many FBI agents embedded within its ranks. The FBI even paid Twitter uh, to employ them. Mm -hmm. So actually paid the salaries of these people. So they give Twitter a subsidy, and then Twitter would in turn flip that over to the employees. And uh, what it what it amounted to was a kind of a nationalization of social media that began uh, in earnest, really, uh, sometime in <clears throat> in the early of uh, 2020, uh, sometime in say February, January, or February, mm -hmm. and it covers everything. So it's Google, which means YouTube, and it's Microsoft, which means LinkedIn, and then it's. Uh, Meta, which means Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then also included in that is 
other things like Pinterest and and lesser known things like your neighbor. I mean, there's all these social yeah. media things that they, they had it covered entirely. And and anybody who was dissenting against this and allowing uh, free open debate about about lockdowns, about vaccine mandates, about masks or mm -hmm. anything uh, got put on a list. And one of them is a social media company called Parler. Uh, really got going. Yes, and, right. In 2020, and and uh, the FBI uh, leaned on Amazon to pull the plug on the company. So they were renting server space from Amazon, and the next thing you know, just one one day the next, they were out of business. So they they really were trying to consolidate and monopolize the information. So, you know, if you wondered over the last four years if there, if there's something strange going on with mm -hmm. the media and what you see. Uh, the things you search for, how come you can't seem to find yeah, exactly. things that are different from 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 what the mainstream believes? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the reason. It was all a kind of a, a construct. It was a mm -hmm. it was a, a central plan to control the public mind. The whole thing to get everybody on board. Yeah, with this. the whole thing. And and so, yeah, it's a stunning revelation. And I I admit, like years ago, I mean, there was. I mean, this is goes back through history those in power want to obviously control information of the masses. But this is a stunning revelation and the facts are there. It's not like some kind of quote, conspiracy theory. I mean, ironically, the ones who are always pitching and trying to dismiss people um, who are researching this as, conspir as, as, as conspiracy theorists are obviously the ones who are up to the conspiracy. Um, and so um, this is kind of a game changer, is it not, uh, Jeffrey? As it is. And we've got many lawsuits that are brewing about these things, and they're and there's they're making headway at various levels, mm -hmm. uh, and in the lower <clears throat> levels and the appeals levels and this kind of thing. But the strange thing about it is that despite these lawsuits ongoing, they're not really making a difference in mm -hmm. slowing down mm -hmm. uh, how much censorship is going on even right now. So we don't really entirely have transparency, so we don't actually know. But I can tell you. I had an interview taken down from YouTube the other day. It was an innocuous interview, lasted an hour and a half, and it wasn't even as dicey as what you and I are saying right now. And and it was it was removed from YouTube within uh, within 24 hours. And I think this is about the 12th interview I've had removed. Uh, so, oh my! You know, it, okay. yeah. And this is YouTube, which is owned by Google. Google's the most important. Mm -hmm. uh, technology company in the world is alphabet mm -hmm. and but the cia is definitely embedded there and i i'm sorry if you know i i feel even awkward saying things like this even though i know them to be for a fact true but if somebody had said to me five years ago oh google's yeah. controlled by cia i would have said whether well, you're, you're a crazy person that's a private company that can't right. be true but what we've seen is this blend of of government and corporate power into one single kind of hegemon mm -hmm. that is really trying to control what you wow. think and believe. Well, it, it is, yeah, it's unnerving that, that you know, I guess what you're alluding to there, Jeffrey, is a kind of a sense of self-censorship. Is that right? Yeah. It's getting worse. If you want to be on YouTube, you know what you can, or you think you know what you can and cannot say. It's not always consistently enforced, but this is the way authoritarianism is, right? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, they don't give you clear rules, so as a result, you're always dancing around. You're super wow. careful. Um, a couple of nights ago, I watched this movie. It came out in the early 2000s called The Lives of Others. It's a, a movie about East, East Germany, and I guess it won Best Foreign Language Picture, something like that. And I watched it, and I thought, wow, we really are headed this direction. It's um, it's quite alarming. Yeah. Now, um, I, I think... Uh, one way to think about this is that the U.S. right now has kind of two federal governments uh, that are working simultaneously mm. uh, with each other or, or sometimes across purposes, but, but they're operating at the same time. It's, one is the legacy government, mm -hmm. the one that maybe took the Constitution seriously, obeyed yeah. the, the limits, um, uh, cranked out the data, you know, just kind of did their level best to you know, be a, a America. And then you have a new round of agencies that were created after Trump's election in 2016 with, with his knowledge or, or, or with, 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 without his knowledge. It's not clear. But they really got, flew into major action in March 2020. And this is the Cybersecurity Information Security uh, Agency, mm -hmm. 
uh, one division within the FBI. There, there's there's also the NIH under yeah. Fauci, the CDC, and so on. Uh, one division of the National Security Council, and so, mm -hmm. and this is a kind of what I what I've called the Great Reset government. Yeah, and right. It, and it's a and a, and it's kind of a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So, so it's uh, it, it's we don't really have a word for it. In the old days, uh, you would you would say this feels like a coup d'état, mm -hmm. and it kind of is, except that um, the 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 people that it came into power under the coup. With with their censorship and their canceling and their mandates and their surveillance and all these things, um, are are very enormously powerful. But they exist alongside the legacy government that right. actually did obey the rule of law and that sort of thing. So yeah. these these two uh, kind of federal governments are operating simultaneously uh, with each other right now. What the, again, the legacy government versus the Great Reset government. Yeah, and so and so, so to be clear, like for a Canadian audience. I think that's an important revelation is the yeah. sense that there are vigorous, um, as if anyone hasn't noticed, a vigorous debate about what kind of society the United States yeah. is going to be. And yeah. within the state, you have a kind of, a, um, uh, I'm not going to say a civil war, but a war of sorts going between these yeah. these institutions. Yeah. And that's part of the, I mean, the microcosm of that is, of course, the, the famous FBI in the sense mm -hmm. that they've always had enormous power. But mm -hmm. in this context, it's very clear that the leadership of the FBI is thoroughly rotten to the core. Yeah. And it's not clear whether the culture or the larger organization can be saved. Now, there are certainly many cases of whistleblowers that have come forward sure. that have revealed this, the receipts. It's not like it's, mm -hmm. a, it's even a debate. The facts are there. The information is stunning. And mm -hmm. what's, what's, what I find fascinating is it's the the level of other agencies that should be checking that power and and creating accountability is where a lot of this malfeasance is not being held to any account. There's no, there's no right. one going to jail. It's really quite stunning, isn't it, with the Department yeah. of Justice and, and so forth, right? But this also explains how it is that you could have all of these lawsuits taking place at all levels of society that are quasi-successful, except right at the very last minute uh, at the appeals level uh, or yeah. at some point there's a panel of judges that just throws the whole thing out exactly and this is why they're not really worried about things like this this major censorship yeah. case they're just going about their business ignoring it even though a federal court in the fifth circuit said oh you can't do this here's our injunction the injunction was upheld um uh, and now it's the injunctions even being uh, scheduled to be heard by the Supreme Court. Yeah. But there's a, a conviction on the part of this great reset government that they don't have to obey this law. Right. So and, they just ignore it. And remarkably, this actually happened yesterday. There was a hearing on Capitol Hill where where the assistant attorney general for the for the Biden's uh, Department of Justice was asked specifically about these cases. Mm -hmm. And she said she had never heard of them before. Yeah. No, they, 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 they walk around. Of course, she's heard of them, but walk around with impunity in yeah. plain sight now, which is really yeah. quite stunning. I, I it is is really quite disconcerting. So what about the First Amendment case, though? Um, the little noticed lawsuit, Missouri versus Biden, as in Joe yeah. Biden? It's gotten almost no uh, public attention. I mean, after the first injunction, after the injunction was upheld by the by the uh, appeals court, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a, a front page article in the New York Times, just one story. Uh, that was it. It was mm -hmm. woefully inaccurate. Mm -hmm. It was putting the lawsuit down. It was saying mm -hmm. it just doesn't mean anything and that sort of thing. But it was one story. Apart from that, it's been very difficult to get any media attention at all. And this becomes very serious because if you don't really have an operative First Amendment in this country, you know you've got you've got a real chance. Freedom's been given a, a big blow yeah. under those conditions. Indeed, you, know, you, you, you really are done if you don't have freedom of speech, That's right. and you have a, and I will use the phrase deliberately, the deep state sitting there censoring mm -hmm. everywhere you turn. Mm -hmm. You do not have freedom of speech, and you don't have a yeah. functioning society in terms yeah. of. The free information of of the seek for, seeking for truth. I mean, it's 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 yeah. really quite disturbing. So yeah. that that is um, going to the Supreme Court, um, 
and uh, the initial decision, I think, by the judge, I would encourage people to read it if they can, um, is, is really quite encouraging. I really admire that judge's decision. He yeah. described what's going on in the U.S. government as 1984 a la George Orwell. Yeah. And I think it was a pretty stunning decision that uh, yes. gives hope, does it not, Jeffrey? Uh, it does. Now, uh, uh, there are many, many, so just so we understand the fullness of this, uh, because the evidence was so overwhelming, the, the judge, before having heard the case, enjoined, passed what's called an injunction to mm -hmm. stop the federal government from doing this. He says, we're pretty sure the way it's going to be decided, yeah. so here's our... Our, our emergency preliminary injunction to stop the government from doing that was appealed. In the appeal, the injunction was gravely narrowed. There was a, a, a an appeal of that appeal, and then it was broadened slightly again. Not enough, but um, and then and then the Biden administration appealed that appeal of the injunction, and that's headed to the Supreme Court. That decision will come out sometime, maybe February or March. Mm, yeah, but keep in mind. This is just the injunction, okay? So the case itself has yet to be heard. And that will not be going to court into probably two or three years. Yeah. And then when it goes to court, it will be at the lowest level. Then there will be an appeals process. And then that itself may go to the Supreme Court. So we could be looking at five years yeah. wow. before we get a con conclusion to this thing. Meanwhile... You've got all these government agencies still working very closely with all the social media um, and and training all these employees in these companies to kind of comply. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm optimistic in a sense, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we shouldn't be having to go through all this stuff. Yeah, this no, it, it's outrageous. And I would say that, I mean, the, the whole revelation that you've got 60 alphabet agencies working hard in concert as yeah. a team to censor everything that moves to political ends is is incredibly disturbing. It is 1984 there, and it would make the CPP, the Chinese Communist Party, blush yeah. when it comes to what they're, well, they're this, trying to pull off. And this is what they want to do. And what's strange about it is that, you know, all these lawsuits are designed to kind of say, hey, look, you can't do this. And then the appeal from the Biden administration is always like somewhere between, yes, we can and we're not doing that. So it's it's and both can't be true. Right. right. <laughs> it's like you, yeah. can't, you can't say we're not doing that at the same time saying, but if we wanted to, we would, you know, and we could. You know, so it's 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 both. And there's no question that the ambition is a full control of the public mind yeah. through the full control of the internet. They want to get rid basically they want to get rid of the internet as we know it. Indeed. So the other side to um, significant legal action is kind of on the consumer product side. We've got the the bombshell of the the Texas lawsuit being tabled by the great AG mm -hmm. um, Ken Paxton. And uh, in the release it says Pfizer engaged in false deceptive and misleading acts and practices by making unsupported claims regarding the company's COVID-19 vaccines and violations of Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. Wow, go figure. So I think that's a brilliant lawsuit, in my humble opinion, that really gets at the heart of the matter. This is a product that claimed 95% effectiveness, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, it comes out more like maybe three or four percent. Who knows? But it's yeah. a fraction. If at all. A fraction. If at all. Maybe if it's all. closer to zero. Yeah. Or but, even maybe um, negative. Who knows? <laughs> and you have to consider, well, there's a number of things about this, uh, just so we understand. It's true that these companies are indemnified from, um, from any kind of liability for the damages, but they're not free under state law to just um, make whatever claims they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still, we still have, it still is a country of laws. So if they're claiming something very effective and under interstate commerce, um, uh, a state says you're in violation of our, of our consumer laws, you can't actually engage in deceptive trade practices. They actually are very vulnerable. And I think this this threat by uh, the Attorney General Paxton is a potentially viable one. And I say this because He's been trying to drop this lawsuit for a long time. I'm going to say yeah. 
I may be estimating, misestimating, but I think it was in the spring of 2023. He was going to drop this lawsuit. And a week before he did, he was impeached. Uh, Just out of nowhere. And and, and it was was really quite an extraordinary process that had not a shred of evidence. Nope. Not a shred of evidence. He he showed up one morning to his office, and the and he's a he's a, an elected an elected mm-hmm. position, the attorney general. Shot out of his office, all of his papers collected, couldn't get to his computer. It Horrible. It, everything was shut down. His phone was shut down. Everything was it was, it was impeached by the legislature. And then uh, and then about two months went by where he wasn't able to do any work. So the voters elected him to his office. He wasn't allowed to do it. Mm-hmm. And they were unable to come up with anything substantial. That they they just alleged this, alleged that. It was all just these weird, complicated things you can't even follow. Then it turned out to it it all fell apart. Mm-hmm. And once the lawmakers looked at it carefully, they said, "Wait, this is entirely bogus. You can't do this." Yeah. And um, he was reinstated. And I was, now we've got the the lawsuit against against Pfizer. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it's it's alive. remarkable. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's a lot of frankly, dirty pool going on here. Yeah, and there definitely the, the, is. You know, it, it, it's kind of like they're playing for all the marbles. When you think of freedom of speech, the amount of money involved is stunning. Uh, yeah. It's hard to, to comprehend. So in this context, though, freedom of speech and information, Jeffrey, do matter in a free and democratic society in order for you to be able to have healthy debate and discussion and and, and actually function. And that's would you say it's, is it too dramatic to say that's in jeopardy in the United States? I think it's been in jeopardy for, um, more than we know, for longer than we know. Um, I I often think about this, you know, how existential is this for us? And I think part of the problem is that when I was growing up, when I was younger, we really did have pretty much full control a fully government controlled media. Mm-hmm. So there were three television stations and there was no other way to get information. There was 30 minutes of news a night and you could take your pick between the three stations. They all said the same thing. Was that and, ABC, CBS and NBC? Yeah, and Yeah, that's that right. It? And then it gradually ra- unraveled over mm-hmm. time. So suddenly we, we had PBS channels then you know, then uh, CNN and then more and more cable news mm-hmm. shows and and then we had uh, talk radio come along, AM talk radio, and then just gradually over the decades. And then the internet. And then, yeah, that was during the 80s. And then then in 1995, we got the web browser invented. And suddenly, you know, and the internet went out, not just with the universities, they were in every every home. And, and, and by 10 years later, we're talking about, you know, 2005 and afterwards. Um, we really did have a kind of a, a freedom. It was uh, uh, uncontrolled information flows, which I believe is very good for democracy. And that's when we started finding out more and more things about what the government was up to. And <laughs> the political systems got a little bit disruptive. And and really, the turning point was 2016. Mm-hmm. Once uh, Donald Trump was elected, there was a widespread sense among a certain class, which I just call the ruling class in this mm-hmm. country, highly educated, Ivy educated, um, uh, w- well-to-do, uh, privileged people, mm-hmm. uh, uh, civil servants, uh, people that that easily make their way between the revolving doors of corporate boardrooms and mm-hmm. and government appointments. Appointments. The pe- people who imagine themselves to be the owners of the country. The good and the great, Jeffrey. Yes, right, right, and and when when Trump was declared the winner in 2016, they, they said, okay, this is not the way this is supposed to work. Guys like this are not supposed to be president. How dare him. And he's up to no, yeah, it's a, he's up to no good and he's gonna do some t- terrible things. And that's when really, my read on the situation is that's when they really got, got to planning. Uh, and uh, they tried to go after him uh, on grounds that he was secretly elected by Russia. That turned into just an absurd <laughs> yeah. thing that that lasted nearly nearly two years. And then they went after him again, they impeached him a second time over some phone call to Ukraine, which mm-hmm. I never really understood. And then um, and then they finally decided to pull out the the biggest the biggest uh, card of all, which is the infectious disease thing. And that that's when it all came together. And then they finally got him. 
uh, once they convinced him convinced him to green light lockdowns. And once he had okayed the lockdowns in March yeah. 2020, he very naively thought he could turn off the economy and turn it back on again and everything would be great. Well, once he turned it off, uh, the, yeah, the rats took over the ship. I don't know what the analogy here would be, but yeah. uh, he was unable to regain his power of the presidency and reduced to, you know, using Twitter and otherwise just giving speeches and, and, it's, and it sounds like a, it sounds like a coup, doesn't it, Jeffrey? Yeah, it really does. It was very much very much like that. I'm not mm -hmm. sure he saw it that way, but he certainly, you know, after March, he didn't really ever act as if he was um, the president of the country again, because I think he knew he sort of wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then um, as part of that March 2020 coup d'etat, that was March 13th, was really the day, um, they also liberalized all the voting rules in this country. Indeed, so yeah. that enabled them to make sure the election that, was done, that that uh, he could not become president. And I remember in those months leading up to the election, I was traveling around here and there. And every time I landed in a different state, I got um, uh, Facebook's Zuckerberg uh, hitting my phone, giving me another ballot. So I, I probably could have voted in five states. Oh, yeah. no kidding. So you actually got <laughs> yeah. multiple ballots too? Oh, yeah. No, wow. I mean, yeah, invitations. Oh, get your ballot right here. Get this ballot here. Oh, you're from Georgia. Get a ballot. Oh, you're from Texas. Get a ballot. And yeah, every... You're you're from Connecticut. Get a ballot. Isn't so, that yeah, something? Yeah, I could have I could have just had had it sent immediately to the hotel. Yeah, and had it forwarded well, to me. I could have voted in five states. And <laughs> see, in, in in Canada, I think we've got a, a generally solid electoral system. Although there's uh -huh. some very valid concerns about um, Chinese interference in 24 specific federal ridings, among other things. Um, so no electoral system is perfect, but we do count our um, ballots in one day. And we do announce wow. the results as a rule. Whereas in the United States, it's almost like you're entering now a la post-COVID rules, an utter, yep. uh, you know, a, a, a bizarre purgatory of election season where yep. elections are going on for a month and you've got, yep. you know, mail-in ballots and you've got third-party organizations literally harvesting, quote, ballots from other parties. It, it's just... To me, it's it's a head scratcher that anyone it is. would allow this to happen in any democracy. It's like a farce, yeah. is it not? Yeah, it is. And there's, uh, as you know, there's two main parties in the U.S. and they're fighting with each other over these rules right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Republicans, as in incompetent as they are, and they do, definitely are, are getting a little more scrupulous about trying to police the system a little bit. Yeah. So this is what has, right now, the major media very concerned that Trump could actually right. win. Right, indeed. Um, and, and, and he's and, uh, done, doing stunningly well in the polls, and it seems like yeah. the more they attack him uh, yeah. and try to lock him up for, is it 900 years now with the four indictments, yeah. Yeah. Um, that he's doing better. So part of this is truly um, kind of a wake-up call for all of us to understand I kind agree. of what's going on in the United States. Yeah. And... Um, we certainly wish you and, and the nation all the best as you come to grips with this. But I, I, I did want to turn to 2024 because what we've really done is we've summarized kind of the, you know, kind of where we're at now in the United States, given this brutal reality of a censorship industrial kind of complex that is very much there in plain sight that almost seems to be operating on its own interests. You know, and mm -hmm. it's not, I mm -hmm. don't see it through partisan lens, but I do want to get to that in a moment. So let's turn to the 2024 election, uh, uh, Jeffrey, if we could. Because um, oftentimes it almost senses that the bigger picture at first, as we look to 2024, is that we have an incredible nation that has made a uh, extraordinary difference from around the world and an, an, an empire of sorts that is on the decline. Mm -hmm. As we look at the stunning levels of deficits, um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and, and, the, and you know, debt is, is incredible. Like there's even talk about the de-dollarization in the world, like just as the British pound was the, yeah. um, the uh, reserve cur currency, you know, it's almost like someday it looks like conceivable that the United States will lose that privilege that it, that it you know, is, is so unique. 
So, and that the elites, and this is kind of similar to Canada, the, the, the narrative that I hear so often, is the elites have become extraordinarily not just uh, incompetent, um, and, but insular, and dare I say, even malevolent in its disdain for their fellow citizens and even for working people. Like, mm -hmm. is, is that a narrative that you'd say is is very much alive in the United States discourse now. Uh, but it's a, it's yeah, one very, of... very true. There's a book I just finished called The Virtue Hoarders, and it came out in 2021. And it was by a person who's very much to the left. And they said, look, the last time, it might have been 50 or 100 years ago since the left actually cared, cared about the working class. Uh, now the progressives who are really constitute the ruling class are overwhelmingly extremely uh, privileged from several generations of wealth. Uh, Ivy graduates, mostly with leg legacy admissions, uh, shunted into these mm -hmm. you know high salary yeah. uh, jobs at major major corporations, revolving in and out of the government, um, and they have no interest in or concern for uh, the working classes uh, mm -hmm. at all. Much less the poor who are invisible to them. In fact, we saw this during the pandemic re response. They wanted to hide in their in their homes and and uh, stream movies in their pajamas and get yeah. paid six figures. Yeah, and and <clears throat> and have the working class to just bring them food, drive right. the trucks, the truckers. Fix, yeah, fix, fix the plumbing and that sort of thing. It's just this extreme uh, class myopia on the part of our rulers today. These are unelected people. They mm -hmm. just have inherited their position, windowed their way in, but they are a rock solid uh, a class of rulers that, yeah. is, has, that has disdain for the rest of the country. You know, they call us deplorables. Um, they hate our, 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 they can't stand Elon Musk. I mean, Elon Musk is facing like wow. eight different federal investigations just since he took over Twitter. You know, for every ground, I mean, one of the grounds is that his company, uh, um, uh, rocket company, whatever it's called, um, did not, uh, maybe it was Tesla even, did not hire enough uh, refugees. Oh, SpaceX. Well, yeah, SpaceX was not hiring enough refugees. Utterly bizarre, like, yeah. Well, so they're yeah, going after him. The Securities Exchange yeah. Commission is mm -hmm. going after SpaceX because he so supposedly has not hired yeah. sufficient number of yeah. refugees. Yeah. And now you've got this full scale advertising boycott on the part of yeah. uh, the Disney and elites. all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's extremely intense right now. And 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 this interview is taking place in the midst of this kind of this wild, this cold war uh, that is going to consume us uh, for a very long time, certainly through the rest of the decade. Um, and 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 the panic that's alive among mm -hmm. this group right now about Trump's popularity. And <clears throat> let me be clear. Uh, I'm not a, 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 a big f fan of Trump. In fact, I wrote a whole book very critical of mm -hmm. him, you know, back in 2016. Yeah. So I'm not like. But you're you know, not a partisan. You're, you're, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. But I do think that we should live in a democracy mm -hmm. so that if, if a, a plurality of vo voters uh, favor this guy as president over the options and his policies, then you know that's the system under which we okay, live. Okay, but but this is to get. but this is the the tactic that's being used. It's not about Donald Trump. Right. He is a figure, a symbol for something that's much more significant in terms that's of right. tidal waves of activity going on between these kind of two Americas, if I would say, kind of this ruling racket. Um, yeah. is that, if that's too strong a word. Yeah. That thrives yeah. off a big state and control mm -hmm. versus frankly, a kind of a, an America which really thrives on more civil liberty and mm -hmm. um, small businesses to um, things that you would think America is. But yeah. is, is it, faith it, and it, faith and freedom and patriotism and that sort of thing yeah. versus the one percent, the one percent that is ruling us doesn't care anything about the Constitution. They actually have disdain for the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in American history, uh, except uh, except to the extent that they want to criticize it. Uh, for being inherently racist and you wow. know, so on. So, so how the <laughs> heck did the 1%, the Al Gore, Al Gore's the epitome of this. I mean, he's yeah. he was a senator. Uh, his dad was a senator out of Tennessee. Yeah. Um, and you've got some guy driving around in a private jet, thriving on green climate change credits and all yeah. kinds of things. Like, 
made all these predictions about things. Nothing has happened true, makes claims about inventing the internet. So not to be too hard on Al Gore, but how did they lose their way so much? Do you have a theory on that, Jeffrey? Um, you know, I, this book is very interesting. It's called The, the Virtue Hoarders. And, and, and she uh, just finds that they uh, gradually, generation after generation, inherited more and more of these kind of uh, uh, privileges and mm -hmm. lived in ever more bubble sort of situations mm -hmm. and during which time the state became ever more powerful. Then when the opportunity came for the Great Reset, um, they've embedded themselves very much in digital technology and all the new technologies and they and you know green energies and and social media and surveillance and data sharing and all these things that are associated with great reset style technologies and they want a greater share for themselves and want permanent power and to get rid of the old world of fossil so-called fossil fuels and you know the, um, physical me you know, meetings uh -huh. and you know all these things that are associated with sort of traditional life they they really just want to wipe them out uh, constitutions and patriotism and all these old values religion <laughs> yeah. they want it all gone and you know of all people it was anthony fauci who in august of 2020 actually wrote an article for the journal called cell oh yeah i heard he about said, that he said this yeah which he basically said this you know you shouldn't be allowed to own pets you shouldn't uh be uh going to family reunions um we all need socially distance now and forever uh, dousing ourselves with hand sanitizer and living off off Zoom. That's really their vision of the future. And you know, this is uh, this is totally disregarding for people's actual values and certainly for the working class values. And meanwhile, they're driving the prosperity to the ground. I mean, U.S. growth rate, rates right now are pathetic um, when they're not manipulated. Mostly, they are manipulated. Right. We, I, I doubt we've ever really gotten out of the recession that came about in 2020. So. Um, and with this is, is becoming a kind of a depopulation population agenda. So um, the child care is hard, if not impossible, to come by in the U.S. And and now you're starting to see the State Department wage a war against what's called the au, au pairs, which are you know people that come into your house to take care of your kids. And they're, the State Department is imposing a rule that would make them three and four times more expensive than they than they are currently, making that making it impossible for people to even afford somebody to look after the kids, which is going to drive all the women out of the workplace and 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 reduce family size even further. So all of this is going on right now. You add all this together, and it really does look like a major crisis for civilization. It really is wow. trying to be a kind of an us them situation. Gosh. Um, and I hate to say that because I never want to live in a world like this. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I didn't want to be the one sounding the alarm on these things, but yeah. it's, it's undeniable now. It, really, everything is at stake. So it, it really is a, uh, you're really challenging us to think there, Jeffrey, about not only the state of the United States, but frankly, of every Western world, including Canada. Yeah. So I do want to look at 2024 with your kind help because there's a kind of a constellation of political parties a landscape, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a little bit confusing, I think, to a lot of Canadians. And one of which is we know we have the Democratic Party, which yeah. traditionally has been kind of the working class party. They were, of course, years ago, the, the, the traditional party of slavery. Um, but they transformed themselves. They worked hard to, um, quote, be the more kind of leftist center party. Um, I mean, it's a bit complicated. But Today, they're really not so much about the working Americans. They're, they've kind of taken on a different kind of ideological mantle of representing, they're kind of woke. There's, there's different wings of the Democratic Party, but they're really about endless spending and maybe even endless wars these days. But yeah. is that yeah. a fair characterization of the Democrats? Uh, it is. I mean, nobody can even figure out why the US is supporting uh, Ukraine in this, in this conflict. It's a big mystery, Russia, yeah. Uh, except and to the extent that it can be explained by you know some sort of Biden family dealings yeah. in, in Ukraine or maybe some bioweapons factors. I don't really know. Right. But it's it, the U.S. can't afford these wars. Yeah. It's just it's just absurd. You know the other thing to remember here is that this is not just a U.S. problem; it's a global problem. So uh, I would encourage everybody to read Klaus Schwab's book called The Great Reset. It's kind of the the Communist Manifesto. Like of, the of Klaus the Schwab. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Klaus Schwab, and 
uh, it's the communist manifesto of the great reset and it's a, it really is a manifesto for what it is that they yeah. uh, what they hope to achieve um and and not just in the us uh, but all over the world so uh, it's quite it's quite uh, dramatic yeah it's an eye now, opener it's kind of shocking to read it actually it's yeah, yeah. so i agree <laughs> Yeah. Now, in terms of the U.S. political system, um, of course, the U.S. does not have a parliamentary system. So if you, if you could you could have 47 percent of the country or 49 percent of the country representing one particular perspective, rallying around one particular candidate, they're still going to lose everything mm -hmm. because it's a winner take all system. Parliamentary systems, even the two percent get some rec some representation mm -hmm. in the in the legislative bodies. Not true in the U.S. What that means is that we would typically default to two parties. Right. Um, that's just a matter of the logic of the situation. Because yeah. when you go to the voting booth, um, you would tend to vote against the person you hate the most. That and and for the person who's most most likely to beat the person you hate the most, even if you don't like them. So that's the way two party systems. That's why uh, first past the post winner take all democracies work. Well. Um, yeah, good so point. this creates a real problem for somebody like Robert Kennedy, who's enormously uh, popular mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, I've just spent some part of yesterday and today reading his new book called The Wuhan Cover-Up, which I think might be the best book on all this stuff. Oh, no it's, kidding. It's, really, it's, it's a work of genius, a thousand pages. It is a masterpiece. Um, he's enormously po uh, popular, but he has to run on a third-party ticket because he was excluded from the Democratic yeah. nomination process. Yeah. Ironically, so, and, and, he, and he would be kind of considered part of the royalty of the Democratic Party. Uh, ironically, yeah. Right? So he's looking at an independent run. Now, the main job of an independent third-party run in this country turns out to be a kind of a spoiler, ruining the election for either Biden mm -hmm. or Trump. Nobody can say for sure which one is more powerful. But what you see, see now happening is more people looking at third-party runs as a way of blunting the impact of RFK. So it's getting extremely complicated. I can see why you're asking wow. these questions. It is complicated. So we could have three or four uh, viable candidates running for third party, none of whom stand any chance of winning, but they're competing for who could spoil the election for the other guy. Wow. And how that turns out in terms of the polls, uh, you tell me. And you see these these things saying, they ask a voters questions like, well, who do you favor, uh, Trump, Biden, or RFK? And RFK comes out on top. But that's that doesn't those kinds of polls are not meaningful in terms of what uh, what they are going to mean operationally in terms of the election because you might love RFK. Let me see how this will work. You might love RFK but really, really despise Trump mm -hmm. and you might, f or despise Biden, you might figure the only way to beat Biden is to vote for Trump. So right. you might not even like Trump and you love RFK but you're still going to vote for Trump because you think He's the biggest hammer you can use against the person you hate the most, which is Biden. The polls are rarely, if ever, constructed this way. So we don't actually know how th people would actually vote once they get into the voting booth. That's it's, it. it's complicated. It's a, yeah. But to be clear, we've got the Democrats, and of course, Joe Biden's ahead of that. And then we've got these dynamic of independence that you've summarized so well, including Bobby Kennedy Jr. to boot. And then you mm -hmm. have the Republicans. And the Republicans are confusing because it seems like there was a reverse takeover of sorts over the last several years by Donald Trump, the so-called yeah. Make America Great movement, which right. was about saying, well, you know, all this governance that's going on is really kind of um, outsourcing manufacturing jobs to Timbuktu, including China. And, you know, you're not really governing this 1% that you so adeptly described. You're not really governing for the American people. You're, you're driving us into the ground. Uh, you're taxing us to death. And um, we don't want these endless wars that our kids fight in and die in. And meanwhile, um, we want to build the United States. And I think yeah. so they've taken over really the Republican Party so that you have a lot of Republicans that would be known as rhinos, right? They're, they're kind of, they claim they're Republicans, but they're really more like Democrats. Yeah. Is that how my, am That's I right. understanding There's a huge right? split within the Republican Party between, uh, between I would say, the what, what you're calling the MAGA people, which is the Trump people. Then you've got the rhinos, who are the Republicans in name only, who can't stand Trump. Then you've got a third faction, 
um, which was represented by somebody like uh, DeSantis mm. um, uh, or Ramaswamy, you know, uh, who don't don't like um, Trump uh, because they think he's too accommodating, right? Sorry, so too accommodating. In, yeah. Okay. To uh, to deep state interests. I mean, you know, is Trump the green light at the lockdowns? And interesting. Um, and has a great deal of affection. He will not criticize the vaccines and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's people that are uh, that are like Trump. Uh, in these terms, might be a, a more moderate character. Um, uh, relative to somebody like uh, DeSantis or Ramaswamy. Isn't that fascinating? Like that. So yeah. the, the point is that, you know, you've got to kind of understand these basics of who these parties are. And then there's another big factor, which is the, quote, administrative state, the so-called deep yeah. state, which seems to be like that fourth arm of government. It's almost yeah. scary. That is kind yeah. of running the show beneath everything, as we've kind of alluded to with this, the so-called... Yeah industrial censorship complex like this is yeah. beyond be that almost seems to be impervious to elections they're almost into selections yeah. not elections yeah. is that fair and that's, jeffrey yeah and that's that's what trump wants to make a dent in their power this is a institution that's nowhere in the constitution you can't find it there's no th nothing about independent agencies in the u.s constitution at all uh, so it's just grown gradually over the last hundred years but especially in the last five mm -hmm. particularly uh, the federal the the federal government, particularly. The federal government, yeah. yeah. And they have their own branches in, in the states and the, and the cities, too, the big cities. Um, and this is the administrative state. And it is the um, fourth branch of government and the single most powerful. And we just cannot continue to function as a free and democratic society so long as uh, yeah. this status quo And, uh, and, and just for people that some Canadians may sitting back saying, well, gosh, this sounds really hard to understand and kind of beyond the pale. I mean, we we have always had the challenge of the, the state becoming too large, too complicated, yeah. and too powerful beyond democratic control. And certainly, we all recall the famous speech by um, President uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, former Allied Supreme Commander and all the rest, uh, warning of the industrial uh, defense complex in his famous public speech, and, and he was onto something. And so that's yeah. metastasized to be really a cancer um, in the United States. Uh, would that be a fair description? Yeah, it's uh, what what Eisenhower condemned as the military and industrial complex has come home, and now it's running basically everything. It's running your social media accounts. Mm -hmm. It's controlling the, the search engines that you use. Uh, it's spying on your email. Uh, it's it's become very uh, aggressive and all pervasive. It, so it's he was stunning. A real so, Jeffrey, as we look at the the big policy issues on the horizon, um, I want to just summarize them and and please help me here. Closing the open border with uh, Mexico and the United States, energy independence as uh, Biden has totally you know, try to turn off the, the American energy industry, which has made affordable energy possible. We've got issues like stopping the censorship and wokeism, especially including the universities. We've got stopping the spending and the political, the politi pol you know, the endless corruption and politicization of so many issues. And uh, we've got the cutting of the deep state. We've got, you know, including the FBI and dealing with what is it called? China and Iran. Is that a fair sum summary? Yeah, um, and there's a lot of uh, American political forces right now that are anxious to externalize the threats. Um, so it's always about Russia, Iran, China, yeah. Mexico, right. blah, blah, blah. But really, uh, what people should be talking about the, is, is the, the enemy within. That's 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 the main problem. I can promise you, as bad as the CCP is in Iran and Russia and Mexico, uh, and their fentanyl or whatever, the big enemy for the American liberty right now is right here in in the United States, and that's what we need to be talking about. And we're talking about that more and more. I'm glad to say. Okay. It's, it's becoming more of a more of a, more of a, a debate. Now. So there is a sign of hope, and and would you say then one of those practical mm -hmm. signs of hopes? is an extraordinary project called Project 2025. I, I know that the Heritage Foundation is all over this in terms of both providing mm -hmm. a very concrete roadmap on policy, yeah. e.g. the actions that a government, a new government would take, 
likely a, a Trump administration. Um, but it's the list of people. It's not just looking at the action of policies. It's actually creating a list of 15 to 20,000 people that would come yeah. in and right size this embedded, dare I say, cancer within the United yeah. States. Would you think that's it's, part of the solution? It, it is, but <clears throat> that itself is a real challenge because you've got to figure that if they don't succeed, uh, these people will never work again. I mean, a lot of people who work for the Trump administration from 2016 all the way to 2020 were not able to get their jobs back, even wow. in Ivy League. So you're uh, saying work. that this is like, so this is how serious this is. These people yeah. are going full bore at anybody who poses them by shutting them out of job opportunities, tr literally putting them in jail. Like this is very yeah. serious time now. Uh, yeah, out of academia, out of the corporate world, out of everything. So the people who are going to work for, for Trump in the second Trump administration, um, it's the last job they're ever going to have. So they've got to do a good job. So the, we really are at an existential sort of turning point right oh. now. And I don't know if Trump's going to be able to attract. Um, my, my mind goes two ways on this. One is he's not going to attract a lot of great talent. On the other hand, everybody who does good work for a second Trump administration will definitely be committed to winning. <laughs> wow. So that's a, another way to look at it. Isn't that something? So 2024 is a very significant year, Jeffrey Tucker, and we're going to keep in touch um, as we continue to work through this. And I really appreciate your help to understand the landscape of the United States, its complexity and its significance. And we certainly wish you all the very best, and we thank you for all your leadership and work. Well, thank you. We've uh, got, the, this is the challenge of our generation. We've got to get this right. And I believe there is hope that we can do it. We can recover freedom. We can re re uh, rediscover our constitution and we can right this ship. Uh, we have to believe that. I think it is possible, but it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of determination and a lot of moral courage. Well, right. well said, Thank Jeffrey. you for Thank watching you. Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.